Hey guys and welcome back for another episode in my mystery series or if you're new here welcome please feel free to subscribe to my channel by clicking on the button down below. At the beginning of December I received an email from the cousin of Raylene Eaton who disappeared in 1974 alongside her cousin Von Walters and they asked me to cover this case which is exactly what I'm going to do today. Yvonne and Raylene have been missing for 49 years, but their families have never given up hope that one day they might finally be able to get some answers. They want to share this story as far and wide as possible. The more people that know the story, the more likely it is somebody with that one piece of vital information will come forward, because there has to be someone out there with all the answers in this case. More than 35,000 people are reported as missing in Australia every single year. That equals one person every 15 minutes. The vast majority of these people will eventually be found, but sometimes they're not. Cousins and good friends Raylene May Eaton and Yvonne K. Waters were two of the unlucky ones who have never been found. Back in April 1974, Raylene was 16 years old. She's described as having olive skin, she's 150 centimetres or 4 foot 9 tall with a medium build. She had long black hair, hazel eyes and a mole on the left side of her neck. She also had a gold cap on a bottom front tooth. At the time she was last seen, she was wearing a pink top, black skirt, brown platform shoes and was carrying a brown shoulder bag. She lived at home with her mum and dad in Bayswater in Western Australia and was working at a nearby plumbing business whilst attending night school, taking classes in dressmaking and shorthand typing. In Raylene's spare time, she loved playing netball and hockey, she was a very sporty person. Her cousin Yvonne was 17 years old, light skinned, 5 foot 1, slim built with ginger hair and brown eyes. When she went missing, she was wearing a long sleeve green top, long blue trousers, brown platform shoes and was carrying a tan shoulder bag. And she also lived at home with her parents, but this time in Maylands. And she worked for a concrete moulding business in Ashfield. I couldn't find much more information about what Yvonne did in her spare time, but I know she did spend a lot of time with her cousin Raylene, who she called Ray, and her boyfriend as well, Bob, who was away for the weekend. On Sunday the 7th of April 1974, the pair were going out for the evening with another friend to the Oxford Hotel in Leederville. Raylene said goodbye to her mum before she left the evening, with her mum telling her to have a good time, only she would never come home. Police have spent a lot of time piecing together the timeline of that evening. Raylene's dad drove her to Yvonne's in Maylands, and from there they both caught the train into Perth, where they then would have had to have caught a bus to Leederville. We know they definitely arrived at the Oxford Hotel. They spent some time there in the Sandgroper Bar with their friend Terry before the cousins decided to head to Scarborough instead to go to the White Sands Tavern, leaving Terry behind. It's believed that they caught the bus to the White Sands Tavern with witnesses later seeing them walking towards the tavern from the direction of the bus stop. And we know they definitely arrived at the tavern as well, where they were seen socialising with a group of men inside around 4.30pm. There were five men in total, but eventually two of the men left, leaving the girls with three. 48 years later, so literally in August last year, 2022, a feature was written for Marie Claire magazine by reporter Melanie Ambrose, and this article throws into question everything people thought they knew about this case. The disappearance of Raylene and Yvonne was incredibly well publicised across Australia at the time. It was a huge case. But in recent years, a veteran investigator called Detective Senior Constable Peter Shanahan has been tasked with the job of reviewing the cold case. The disappearance of Raylene and Yvonne was incredibly well publicised across Australia at this time. It was a pretty big case. But in recent years, a veteran investigator, Detective Senior Constable Peter Shanahan, has been tasked with the job of reviewing the cold case. And in looking through all the dusty evidence boxes, he's come to realise that all is not as they first thought. Finally now, almost 50 years after they disappeared, the real facts of the case, the real clues, might finally be coming to light thanks to Melanie Ambrose and Shanahan. The Marie Claire article notes that the men the girls are with were in their mid to late 20s and were described as unkempt. They looked like tradies or mine workers. In the usual crowd of the White Sands Tavern, they definitely stood out as unusual, especially chatting away to these two young girls, clearly young girls. Friends of the girls were also at the tavern that night and one of these chatted to Raylene in the foyer, making small talk, and she asked Raylene who they were with. She pointed to the men through the glass and the friend did say it struck her as strange at this time. 
The friend said she thought immediately that the men looked like bad types and she wondered why they would be hanging out with Raylene and Yvonne. Something that does strike me as a bit odd here is that when Raylene was asked who she was there with, she didn't just say Yvonne and then allude to the fact they'd started chatting to these random men after they'd arrived. No, she specifically said she was there with these men. Was this a pre-planned meeting? Did Raylene and Yvonne know them beforehand? Did they choose to leave the Oxford Hotel early and come to the tavern because they knew these men would be there? Around 6pm, Raylene and Yvonne left with these three men, with Raylene turning to the doorman who she knew, saying she would see him at Easter. The group all stood in the car park talking for a little bit, and then they disappeared, never to be seen again. There's been no bodies found, no crime scene to be investigated, no witnesses of anything untoward. The girls just vanished. And of course, as often tends to be the case, when their parents went to Bayswater Police Station the next morning to report that their daughters hadn't come home, the police just brushed their disappearances off as a runaway case, despite their families insisting that, that absolutely wasn't what happened here. These girls were both sensible, responsible young girls. Yvonne would always call her parents if she's going to be more than half an hour late home, like without a doubt she would always do that. They had no reasons to run away, why would they? These were 16, 17 year old girls who had their whole lives ahead of them. They had no particular problems in their lives, bar the usual teenage dramas. I know no one can ever say with 100% certainty whether or not somebody has run away, but there are always the warning signs in a person's life that would make the likelihood of them running away a lot higher. Raylene and Yvonne had none of those signs. It was much more likely that foul play was involved in their disappearances, but it took the police way too long to take action. In fact, as Raylene's cousin told me in an email, police decided to go with a line that they probably just shacked up with some boys, and that didn't deserve any further investigation apparently. As I mentioned earlier in the video, Yvonne was in a long-term relationship with her boyfriend, Bob Webb, and it was expected by a lot of people that they would eventually get married, maybe not too far into the future. The thought of Yvonne being shacked up with some boys was about the opposite of who Yvonne was as a person. Perhaps it would have been more believable in the case of Raylene, who was single and absolutely beautiful by all accounts, but still family members say there's no way she would just disappear in such a way and not let them know. Plus, it's just offensive, isn't it? Saying that two teenage girls disappear, but it's fine because they're with some men. The underlying illusion here being they're just being sluts, they don't warrant a search. It's misogynistic, but that's a whole video for another day. One of my New Year's resolutions has actually been to read more non-fiction and I've been particularly focusing on non-fiction around being a woman in a patriarchal society and misogyny and already I don't think I'll ever see the world the same way again. I've already got so many thoughts about all the things I've learned and how they intersect with true crime and how law enforcement deals with women going missing. Maybe I will do a whole video on that at some point but I can't imagine that'll make me very popular. But I digress. It is said that Raylene was a bit of a magnet for boys. The Marie Claire article reports that at the time she disappeared, she was seeing three different boys. Not official boyfriend-girlfriend relationships, but in today's terms, I suppose, seeing might be the correct term here. In a letter she wrote to her parents before she disappeared, she also tells them about a dag who would wait on the corner of White and Irvine streets every single night to give her a lift home. It doesn't seem like this is something that Raylene asked for or particularly liked or wanted and it may have been an interesting lead to look into at the time, but of course, it never was. Was this man potentially one of the three men the girls were seen with before they disappeared? It took six whole months for police to upgrade Yvonne and Raylene's case from a simple missing persons report to a suspicious vanishing. Six months for a proper investigation to finally begin. And of course, in that time, anything could have happened to the girls. And leads that would have been fresh in potential witnesses' minds at the time would have long been forgotten. Vital leads, without a doubt, would have been lost because of this delay. As Shanahan says in the Marie Claire article, today it's different, we have technologies, phones, bank accounts, CCTV footage, to identify very quickly whether there's foul play or not. A file can escalate from missing person to something more sinister in hours. This was not the case back in 1974. Despite the delay though, police were able to ascertain a couple of bits of seemingly important information. They found out that the girls had last been seen with the men walking towards a white panel van with Queensland number plates with the prefix PXJ. 
For 48 years, this has been the number one most publicised lead in this case. And this case would eventually become pretty big news across Australia. Everyone did eventually hear about the case of the missing teenage girls. But by that point, it was simply too late. Also, after the investigation began, a huge piece of information came out when police said they had been able to identify the three men the girls had been with at the tavern. A newspaper article from the Melbourne Truth at the time reads, Truth has been given the first names of the three men, a description of their vehicles and part of the licence number of the vehicle. Teenage friends of the men have confirmed that they were bound to Darwin. The fact that this information was publicised likely made a lot of people think that these men had been identified and subsequently cleared of any wrongdoing, because no arrests ever came on the back of this information. But Shanahan says now that the men were reportedly identified by another tavern customer, who told the police they were classmates from Wynnum State School in Brisbane. But upon taking another look at this case, another modern look, nothing about this lead checked out. Shanahan says there was no hard evidence this person knew the men at all, and he discovered that the witness was a convicted fraudster and a fabulist, someone who likes to tell tall tales, a liar. For 48 years, the public narrative of this case has been that these three men had been positively identified, but that was never the case. The witness never retracted his story, despite no evidence at all that he actually knew them, so the investigators at the time were never able to completely disregard it. False information in cases like this is so damaging and this is a prime example. It's why I don't like to cover recent ongoing cases, even if I do have the absolute best intentions. Accidentally sharing false information really can damage a case beyond repair, if that false narrative becomes accepted by the public, as happened in this case. In terms of leads that Shanahan is following in the current day, or at least as of the Marie Claire article in August 2022, there's a red van that he's trying to track down, as well as a possible person of interest who drove said van. Raylene apparently had a boy after her at the time who was showing her a bit too much attention. I'm unsure if this is the same boy who I referenced earlier who would always wait to give her a lift home. A family member of Raylene's would say that this boy had been putting pressure on her for a relationship, but she wasn't that interested in him and he was very unhappy about the fact that she turned him down, telling her, nobody walks away from me. But was that just an empty threat from a teenage boy? I assume he was a teenager, I hope he was a teenager. Or was this a foreshadowing of what he had planned? But the threat was so concerning that the day after Raylene disappeared, her mum Jean actually went to this boy's house as she had her suspicions. When she arrived, his landlady was the one to open the door and she said that he was still asleep as he'd been up all night and apparently he'd even used the washing machine in the early hours of the morning. Yes, suspicious. What needed washing so urgently that he had to do it in the early hours of the morning and risk waking everyone up? It is believed that this man, this boy, whoever he was, was at the tavern on the day of the disappearance and he drove a distinctive red panelled van, a lead that Shanahan is trying to follow today but of course almost five decades out, that's quite tricky as the van was probably long ago scrapped. And to add to potential suspicion here, this boy would actually also change his name very soon after and around the same time that the missing persons report was upgraded to a criminal investigation, he suffered a mental breakdown. Today, this man, who isn't named anywhere, we don't really know anything about him, is in his 70s and lives in an isolated part of Perth. Of course, this could all be pure coincidence, this boy, man, may well have had nothing to do at all with Raylene and Yvonne's disappearance, but we don't know if he was even questioned or even looked at at the time. It's not clear if even Shanahan has had a chance to be able to talk to him either, but this perpetrator, this man, this woman maybe, hasn't slipped up in 50 years, so who's to say that they're gonna do so now? This is a particularly tricky cold case because we don't have much to go on here at all. There's no bodies, there's no DNA to try and match to a perpetrator, there's no clues at all. You've got two teenage girls who went on a night out, who were seen by a doorman chatting to some scruffy looking men in the car park one minute, and the next, they were gone. No one saw them actually leaving in a car with these men. These men could have nothing to do at all with their disappearances. Maybe Raylene and Yvonne left the car park alone and tried to hail a taxi or walk towards the bus stop or tried to hitchhike. But it is very interesting that despite all the media attention on this case, not a single one of these three men have ever come forward to identify themselves. Is it possible they never saw the media coverage? I suppose, but probably unlikely. 
Maybe in the six months before it started to get more attention, they forgot about the two girls in the tavern. Maybe it was just a very typical night for them. But from what witnesses say, it seems like they did know these men they were with. They were likely acquaintances at the very minimum. And if two girls you knew even just loosely went missing, you would probably at least hear about it through the grapevine. Or maybe they've never come forward because they're worried about becoming suspects, even if they are innocent. Or maybe they're just not innocent. Maybe they really did do something. The fact that all three men have remained completely silent is impressive though, that not one of them has caved under pressure and come forward to identify themselves or any others. Maybe just one of them was responsible for the deaths and threats we made to keep the others quiet as accessories to murder. This is all speculation, we don't know anything at all in this case. The only way this one is going to get solved at this point is maybe if the bodies are found, which is unlikely 50 years on, or if witnesses do come forward. Maybe someone does know something that they've been too scared to come forward and say, but now 50 years have passed, they might feel more comfortable doing so. But it's important that people come forward now. 50 years have almost passed, people who were there that night at the tavern who might have information will now be coming to the end of their natural lives in the next decade or so. Hence the push for new information, the push in talking about this case. There is a massive reward here for any information that helps solve this case of a quarter of a million Australian dollars. I don't think I've ever seen a reward for such a high amount. That goes to show how desperate the authorities are to finally get this case solved. If you have any information, I'll leave the number for Australian Crime Stoppers down below where you can even leave an anonymous report if you wish to do so. Sadly for the family, the pain didn't end with the disappearances of Yvonne and Raylene. Nine days after his sister disappeared, Raylene's 18-year-old brother Graham went out searching for the girls with Yvonne's boyfriend, Bob. They were driving around just keeping an eye out when they got into a car accident in Hammersley, in which the car ended up rolling. Graham broke his neck, and when the police turned up at the Eaton store, they thought it was because Raylene had been found. Instead, it was to say that Graham, their only other child, was in critical condition in hospital. On April 29th, 1974, he would sadly die in hospital. I can't even begin to imagine the pain of their parents, the butterfly effect that Raylene's disappearance set emotion here. In her grief, their mother Jean turned in somewhat of a private investigator determined to find her daughter, along with Vaughn's mum, Alice. Together, the sisters-in-law would travel across Australia following leads because the police weren't doing anything, they researched possible sightings, they did everything until their money ran out and they couldn't do so anymore. They fought for media coverage of their daughter's cases. Publicity didn't come easy in a time before social media and the internet. They even followed reports of sex trafficking all the way to Asia and they found girls who looked like Raylene and Yvonne. The mums got on planes to go and investigate these reports themselves. They didn't find anything, but they never gave up. Just, it was just the epitome of a mother's love. Sadly, Jean died in 2018, age 95, and Alice in 2021, age 100. To the day they died, they hoped that their daughters would reappear, and now after their deaths, the rest of the family are determined to finally get answers. They're really on a push in the media to share this case as much as they can. And here comes my usual call at the end of this episode. If you live in any of the areas I've mentioned today, in Perth, in Scarborough, in Maylands, in anywhere I've mentioned, please, please, please do share this video. Talk to your older relatives and friends about it. Anyone who is alive at this time who may have been in the White Sands Tavern who may know something, just share the word, spread the word. Thank you so much for tuning in today and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.